This gospel reading today reminds me of another gospel lesson from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13. It says, You, all of you, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled under foot. Well, Jesus said on another occasion, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Today, it's really considered pretty normal to be a Christian. And most of the time, we're not out of favor with others simply because we are a Christian. I wonder, though, if over the years we've gained the favor of people as Christians, but maybe we've lost a little bit of our flavor. That is the text today. Jesus says salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Or if salt lost its flavor, what good is it? You see, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he was paying them a high compliment. He called them salt. And that was a pretty good thing. You see, in the ancient world, salt was seen as a very valuable commodity. It was even used as currency for trading and economic reasons in many countries of the world. And it was used that way even up into reasonably modern times. During an invasion of Ethiopia, in the 19th century, Italian soldiers found large caches of salt that were stored in bank vaults, along with the other treasured items and currency. So you see, Jesus was paying his disciples, and I think you and I as well, when he calls us the salt of the earth. We were made, after all, in God's image, to be the salt of the earth. But when he asked, what good is salt if it's lost its flavor, it no longer seasons food? You see, you don't put salt into food for any other reason than one, to preserve and two, to add some flavor. There's no particular food value to salt. Indeed, too much salt is, is destructive to the human body. Of what value is salt if it's lost its flavor? And Jesus is saying that over 2,000 years ago, not just to his disciples, but you and I today, on this September day in McAllen, Texas. What good is it to be a follower of mine if there is nothing distinctive about your life? Jesus asks. If by following me, you make no real contribution to the life of the world. If there is no redemptive power flowing through a blurring of lifestyles. What good is it? Jesus taught his disciples 
that righteousness to what he called them to was a righteousness that exceeded that of the Pharisees. Winston Churchill once said, the flame of Christian ethics is still our highest guide. I wonder if Churchill would say that today. We have gained favor, but maybe we've lost some of our flavor. One pastor tells about listening to his father tell a story about a neighbor whose barn had burned down, and the entire community gathered together to help rebuild it. His father and others working on the barn were told to put up the rafters and to saw them. The, they first cut a rafter and then they traced around it with a pencil to make the second rafter. Then they did the same thing with the third and the fourth. They did the third based on the size of the second and the fourth based on the size of the third. <coughs> what they didn't take into account was the size of the pencil mark. So it made each rafter a little bit bigger than the other one, when it should have been the same size. And after a while, even though that's just a small mark, that pencil mark, after a while it can amount to a significant difference. By lunchtime, they looked up at the barn and they discovered that it was going at a strange angle because they had deviated from the original standard. Maybe we can sense that as a society, our barn may be a little askew today. It hasn't exactly followed the original standard. I read here recently that a new Guinness world record had been set for the shortest sermon ever preached. One Episcopal priest stood up, looked out at his congregation, he stood there for a moment, and then he said one word, love, and then sat down. Now, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> I'm not doing that this morning. You're not that lucky. But saying that one word that the priest said is to say what is at the heart of our faith and our very existence. The whole purpose of our faith is to reveal the word love. The love of God for the world and to invite all people to share in that love and for us to share that love with one another. Dr. Evie Hill was a beloved pastor serving a church in the Watts area out in California in Los Angeles. And during the burnings and the lootings and the riotings, Back in the 1960s, Dr. Hill did a very painful thing. He denounced his neighbors and his church members who were destroying property and stealing from the merchants. And during the worst part of the looting and the rioting, this kind of preaching brought serious threats to him as well as to his church. But the worse the rioting became and the looting became, the more Dr. Hill publicly condemned those who were doing those acts. One night, his telephone rang and his wife noticed after he got off the telephone how solemn he seemed and how serious he seemed. And she asked him, what's that all about? And he just, oh, it was just nothing. And she knew better. 
And so she hounded him, as wives are prone to do, and uh, continued to ask him what was going on. So he finally broke down and he told her. And so late into the night, they discussed the situation, and they came to the conclusion that there was no way that they could watch over a 24-hour period to be sure that his car had not been bombed, because that was the message on the telephone. <clears throat> they were going to bomb the car within it, in it. The next morning, Dr. Hill got up, and he went out in the kitchen. Usually his wife had breakfast for him. No wife. He looked out in the carport. No car. And he became very nervous, wanted to know what happened. And he was just about getting ready to call 911 when his wife drove back in the car, into the carport. And she said she just got up to drive the car around to be sure it was going to be safe for him to drive that morning. Dr. Hill said from that time on, I never even thought about asking my wife if she loved me. I saw her love in action, so I didn't ask, have to ask for the words. You see, that's what Jesus is saying to you and saying to me this morning about the saltiness. He wants to see our love in action because it's no good if we don't do it. The world needs us to show our saltiness. There's a time-honored story about a pastor who was considered to be a, a great lover of children. But one day he looked out his front door and he just had a new sidewalk freshly poured with concrete. <laughs> And some youngsters were playing in his nice, freshly poured concrete sidewalk. And he rushed out and he yelled at the children. And someone said to him, well, Pastor, we thought you liked children. And he said, oh, I love them in the abstract, <laughs> but not in the concrete. <laughs> See, the world is looking for concrete demonstrations of Christian love. <coughs> we can do that with the ministries and the new worship services that we plan in this congregation. John Killinger, in a sermon <coughs> entitled The Great Importance of Little Deeds, maybe the power of one, and he concluded that sermon by saying, it's an exciting thought that when we die and we come into the presence of God and in all its fullness, it will not be our major accomplishments that speak for us. He was president of a bank. She was the first woman senator in the state. He was the author of 22 books. But it will be apparently the small, inconsequential things that we've forgotten long ago. He mowed my lawn when I was sick. She cared for my child when I went to the market. He sent me flowers when I needed them the most. She washed and mended my socks. These are the little things, inconsequential, but they hold the world together. They are the small stones that comprise the great cathedrals where God is worshipped. The little things. They shall be remembered, says Killinger, like stars in the crown of the saints. The world desperately needs to see 
our love in action, of what value is our faith if our love is not stronger, our love for one another, and our love for the world. Our love needs to be strong enough and big enough for the whole world. It sometimes seems that love can be so petty and so self-centered if our love is not stronger than the world's love, of what value is our Christian faith? Of what value is our faith? If the salt stays in the salt shaker, here we are all in the salt shaker. What value is there to that if we don't get the salt out of the salt shaker. Salt does not exist for its own good. Salt exists <coughs> in order to season, in order to preserve. You know, this is an exciting time, if you think about it, to follow Christ, to be a Christian. When we see the attention that the Pope got, in these last few days in this country. And the crowds and the throngs that went to see him and the excitement and the love that poured out. You have to be able to see that there is a great thirst for the love of God, regardless of your faith tradition and your beliefs. People are coming out of all faiths and expressing their thanks for this man of peace and love. Because they're expressing their desires, that's what they want to see in this world, is peace and love. So it makes an exciting time to be a Christian. It's an exciting time to be a Christian in McAllen, Texas, where there are over 70,000 people who do not express any kind of affiliation with any faith tradition but yet they express a belief in God. And they may just be looking for a way to express that belief and love in God, or at least to be exposed to it. And that's our excitement. We have that opportunity to get the salt out of the salt shaker, to see the people, and to help the people come to us. You know, statistics show that nearly 9% of all the people who have ever lived throughout the history of the world are alive today. Think about that. That's a large number of people. It's an exciting time to be able to love, to serve, and to know God. What an opportunity we have to be the salt to be loving, to be the light that Jesus calls us to be. Maybe you notice something there. Salt, leaven, and light. All three are penetrators. Salt penetrates meat. Leaven penetrates the loaf or the bread. And light penetrates the darkness. You see, we are called to penetrate the world in which we're set, right here in McAllen, Texas. If we do not, of what value are we? God has called us to be the salt, right where we are, with a higher standard for living. Catch that. He's called us to develop a higher standard for a living, not a higher standard of living. You see, our purpose is to make lives better for all of God's children, not just to think about how things can be better in our lives. Let's be sure 
its flavor has not gone out of our salt. Let's see that the flavor of our salt is there for all to see and to taste. Amen.